everyone. My name is Stephen Slaughter, and I am today's temporary host for the USGS Landside Hazard Program Seminar Series. Your usual host, Matt Thomas, is uh, in the field this week. During today's presentation, please remember to keep your microphones muted and your video turned off. We ask the speakers to reserve 10 minutes before the top of the hour for questions. So following the presentation, you can submit questions via the chat function or preferably use the raise your hand feature to ask questions using your microphone and camera. Today's speaker is Jeremy Lancaster from the California Geological Survey. He'll be introduced by Paul Burgess. Paul, take it away. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Lancaster to our seminar today. Jeremy has been with the California Geological Survey since 2006, and most recently has been at the helm as our program manager for the Regional Geologic and Landslide Mapping Program since January of 2019. Jeremy started at the CGS in the Geologic Mapping Program and served as a senior engineering geologist in our Forest and Watershed Program from 2016 to 2018. Prior to Jeremy's tenure at the CGS, he worked in the private sector doing geotechnical consulting and also for Caltrans in the early to mid 2000s. He earned his bachelor's degree in geology from Cal Poly Pomona in 2000 and holds professional certifications as a California registered geologist and certified engineering geologist. He has a long-standing driving interest in landslide processes and hazards, which he has leveraged to envision and create a diverse portfolio of landslide and debris flow hazard mapping projects at the CGS. Of a special and also very somber note, Jeremy was part of the interagency Montecito debris flow response team in 2018, an experience that deeply impacted him. He has unique breadth and depth of experience to share with us. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Jeremy. The virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, and you can see my screen and hear me just fine. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thanks. OK, so title of the talk is Landslides Across California's Diverse Terrain, um, a topic that could take 12 hours, um, but I've decided to take uh, 12 hours of material and stuff it into uh, about 45 minutes. Um, so it should be fun. Um, so away we go. Let me see, make sure that my. Hold on one second. It's a little lag on my um, PowerPoint. Ah, there we go. OK, general outline. Um, I'm going to talk about CGS's uh, landslide programs and products. I'm going to try not to bore you, um, but then I will I will start uh, uh, after that on the physical setting of you know California's physical setting. Uh, I'll talk about historic landslide events, um, damages and costs. Um, I'll provide some examples of those historic landslide events, and then I'm going to take you off into um, the wonderful world of mega landslides in California. So we're going to go into landslide um, fantasy world. Um, so for all of you that are landslide enthusiasts, stay till the end. It'll be worth your time. Um, so a little bit on the uh, the California Geological Survey's uh, landslide related programs and their funding. Um, there are there are five technical principal technical programs within the California Geological Survey. Um, there are three uh, that utilize landslide um, maps. Um, or perform landslide mapping themselves. There's the regional geologic and landslides mapping my program. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, roughly utilize about $750,000 a year, which is three PY to uh, to uh, perform land landslide inventory mapping and landslide hazard assessments in the state. Uh, the forest and watershed geology program spends about a, a half PY of funds on landslide inventory mapping in forested terrain on state lands in, in this within the state. Um, and then the seismic hazards program uh, spends about uh, 500K uh, to prepare uh, landslide um, zones of required investigation or seismically induced landslide hazard zone uh, products, which are derivative products. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, I put our mission on here because I think it's important for folks to understand um, 
the the state the California Geological Survey we provide scientific products and services about the state's geology, uh, seismology, and mineral resources, including the related hazards that affect the health, safety, and business interests of the people of California. Um, we are an applied science agency. Uh, we look to we do research, but we also look to research for. Um, for uh, for methods that can be applied um, broadly across the landscape um, to help um, California citizens. Um, <clears throat> so the regional geologic and landslides mapping program, um, there's we do a variety of things. Uh, we support our Department of Transportation in the state um, under contract, uh, currently not under contract with them now, but we've done about um, 450 lineal miles of highway corridor landslide mapping um, for the state DOT, um, and that's the map on the left. Actually, let me get my um, let me get my laser pointer here. That's this map on the left um, that shows um, the the general distribution and relative activity state of landslides along a highway corridor um, that's going up this river valley um, with overlaying on top of the geology there. Um, so again, 450 lineal miles, and we're looking to do more of that work for them in the future. It's really useful for them from a planning perspective, and then, to, you know, uh, both for highway, um, you know, realignment planning perhaps, and for um, for looking at uh, a highway corridor to understand um, what could happen during a specific storm scenario. Uh, we also operate a, uh, well, let me say this, you know, uh, uh, following our sisters and brothers from the Oregon and Washington geological surveys, um, we've developed a reported landslides database, which is a crowdsourced database. We have a student um, who, after storm or earthquake events, um, is pulling down um, social media posts, um, documenting landslide location, the timing, um, the landslide type, um, and then Paul Burgess, who introduced me, is the professional, the registered professional geologist that reviews that data. He he vets it, uh, makes sure the classification is correct, um, ensures that we have good photo documentation, and then that gets uploaded to our reported landslide database. And there's really two goals with that database. One is just a it's a public awareness. Um, Piece, right? It's good for the public to know that there's landslides occurring. Um, and um, and then two, it's really on the back end, it's a database that where we can house, you know, really good information on, on timing, uh, location, landslide type, so that we can um, understand triggering mechanisms um, from a regional standpoint. Um, and then, as I said earlier, we have about, we spend about, uh, 750k on landslide inventory mapping um, for um, different regions of the state. We're, we're primary, primarily focused on communities where there's development pressure, where there's seismic hazards, um, you know, where there's, um, you know, landslides could affect populations and not, we're not out in the nether regions. Um, so all the, those, uh, those landslide inventory um, projects are done at the seven and a half minute quadrangle scale. They are peer reviewed um, and then uploaded to our statewide landslide inventory database. And that's what this is on the right here. Um, OK, a little bit on the seismic hazards program. Um, as as you might be aware, um, California um, is the second most seismically active state um, in the country, um, Alaska being number one. Uh, but we are number one in seismic risk, um, and that should be obvious to most, right? We have about 40 million people in the state. Uh, most of them are in population centers um, around active faults like the Los Angeles Basin, Los Angeles, Orange County, the entirety of the Bay Area. Um, and that this map here depicts the 2% and 50 uh, ground motion, uh, the um, uh, peak ground acceleration uh, due to that um, earthquake re return period, um, with the reds being, of course, very high peak ground acceleration. Um, so uh, the seismic hazards program, um, they utilize basic landslide inventories um, to prepare um, earthquake-induced landslide hazard zones, and that's what this map is on the right, and I'll explain it. But what happened after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake is the legislature um, approved um, uh, 
the Seismic Hazard Zonation, Seismic Hazards Mapping Act, excuse me, in 1990. Uh, and um, that designates uh, or provides the authority of the state for the state geologist to develop um, earthquake hazard zones. And so th this map here is one of those zones for the Beverly Hills quadrangle showing in green liquefaction zones uh, in yellow um, fault. Um, uh, Alcos Perillo earthquake fault zones and then in blue up here are the are the um, landslide hazard zones, seismically induced landslide hazard zones. And so they utilize geology, they utilize shear strength data and slope, um, uh, ground motion, um, and our landslide inventories, both the probable and definite um, class classified uh, landslide polygons to develop these zones. Um, and they perform a new mark displacement analysis um, to develop the zones. Um, the map in the middle here shows where all the high risk areas have been um, completed. Um, those are um, sorry, the red are the are the areas in high risk that have been completed and the orange are areas in high risk where we need to still do um, perform the zoning effort. Um, and those will re require uh, good geology and landslides data to do that work. Um, the, the seismic hazards program also um, uh, prepares probabilistic tsunami um, hazard inundation maps. Um, and so this is on the, the north coast here showing uh, inundation, inunda tsunami inundation hazards under different return periods. So the 475, 975 and 2475 return period tsunami inundation zones. And then the map on the right is a service um, that is provided by the CGS that depicts uh, the the 975 year return period that's used for emergency response planning, evacuation planning, et cetera. But the, um, the reason why I'm showing this is because uh, the seismic hazards uh, program, the tsunami unit is preparing an inventory of offshore um, landslides along the California coast. And uh, this is work that's in progress. Jackie Bott is taking the lead on this and has mapped about 700 landslides off the coast um, uh, to, to better understand potential uh, uh, tsunamogenic landslide sources. Okay, Forest Watershed Geology Program. Um, the Forest Watershed Geology Program, they um, work with the depart our state Department of Forestry, which is called CAL FIRE, um, to uh, perform timber harvest plan reviews um, in California's uh, timberlands. Uh, they are um, obviously interested in landslides and erosion. Um, they are mapping these features to, to better understand um, how uh, timber harvest could affect or um, affect landslide hazards or increase erosion and sedimentation to streams affecting aquatic species, um, et cetera. Um, they prepare guidance documents. Uh, they conduct geologic and landslides mapping, and I'll show you um, some examples of that. The um, so this map on the upper left is a timber harvest you know unit it's a timber harvest plan sorry uh, boundary and here they're compiling the best available geology and landslide data and then they're looking at aerial photos and lidar to map um, the the presence and type of landslides in this terrain um, to provide uh, you know back to cal fire uh, in a certified california you know, certified CEQA process um, so that um, the the landslides can be taken into consideration, and um, and there's um, it can be ensured that there's not incompatible activities, um, such as you know timber harvest over active landslide deposits. Um, and the map on the right is um, a geologic and landslide map um, for the Iaqua Buttes seven and a half minute quadrangle, um, and this is a uh, you know they. I mentioned at the onset, they spend about uh, $125,000 a year on just doing landslide mapping, which is a small amount, um, but they're working, they're chipping away at these seven and a half minute quadrangles. This this map shows some landslides, deep seated landslides on here that are, you know, um, as big as a section. So um, uh, roughly a square mile um, in size. 
OK, and, and then they prepare guidance documents, the forest watershed geology program. So just to highlight a few note 50 factors affecting uh, landslides and forested terrain. Uh, guidelines for engineering geologic reports for timber harvest plans. Uh, these are really important because uh, they, 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 they somewhat establish a, a bit of, well, they're guidance documents, but they somewhat establish a bit of a baseline of practice um, for folks working on, uh, on timber harvest plans. Professionals working on timber harvest plans, I should say. Um, the, um, so the last topic for the forest and watershed geology program, they are the lead for our um, state's watershed emergency response team assessments. I say that they're the technical lead. CAL FIRE is the operational lead um, uh, because they are they have you know incident command um, in these burn areas. But the um, the watershed emergency assessment teams, they mirror the federal burn area um, emergency response team assessments. Um, so they go in um, after a wildfire, they gather existing hazard and remote sensing data, they determine soil burn severity, they model the hazard, they utilize models like the USGS's post wildfire um, you know, probability and volume models amongst others. They perform geomorphic interpretation, right? Our homes uh, situated on an alluvial fan or a debris fan. Uh, they identify values at risk. Uh, they develop emergency protective measures or recommendations. Um, and then they assist with rainfall and threshold determination. Communicate those findings um, to the local communities, the emergency managers, um, with the intent of risk, risk reduction being the final result. Um, the graph on the upper right shows how many work deployments have occurred over the last 17 years. Um, in 2020, uh, we had about 12 deployments. I don't have the 2021 data here, but we had about 4 million acres burned. Uh, it was over 4 million acres burned in 2020. Um, and then I, over a couple million acres burned um, in 2021 thus far. Um, and then the orange, the, the orange bar here shows that um, how many of these that we were deployed on actually had debris flow events or you know, hyper concentrated flows, rock falls or landslides. Um, so about half, half of the um, half of the fires where we deployed work teams to in 2020 had actual events occur on them. And last year was pretty much a drought year for California. Um, OK, that's it on the programmatic stuff. Um, now let's talk about landslides. Um, OK, so let's talk about California's physical setting. I have two maps here on the screen. Uh, one, you know, we've got the basic geology and the basic uh, faulting um, for the state. Um, these are really simplified maps. I, I put the simplified ones up here because I don't I didn't think you could see the detail on a small screen. But essentially, California is divided up into 11 geomorphic provinces. Each one of those geomorphic provinces has um, very specific physical characteristics, um, hydroclimate, et cetera. Uh, you know, the Sierra Nevada is one of them. Uh, the coast ranges is another one. The transverse ranges is another one. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the peninsular ranges down here, uh, you know, we've got basin and range, uh, Modoc Plateau. Um, anyways, the the main point I, I'll talk. The reason why I'm mentioning those is I will actually be showing maps and describing landslides in each of those provinces. Um, but really, the Sierra Nevada is characterized by, you know, primarily uh, granitic rocks um, with, you know, Paleozoic roof roof pendants mixed in uh, Jurassic accreted Jurassic rocks on the western margin. The coast ranges are you know primarily um, you know Great Valley sequence um, and um, Franciscan melange uh, which is material that was subducted in the trench off the coast of California uh, back in uh, you know Jurassic Cretaceous time. Um, and and the you know, those two units, the Franciscan formation and uh, the um, Great Valley sequence, um, tend to produce uh, 
quite a bit of landslides, but then going, you know, younger in time, you start to look at these, you know, the brown on the description of map units, generalized description of map units here. When you start to get into the Cenozoic units and especially the Neogene units, the light browns, um, those units are really prone to landslides, um, deep seated, shallow landslides, et cetera. Um, so I'm talking about um, geologic units like the Monterey Formation, the Modelo Formation, Pico Formation, Capistrano Formation. There's there's a whole litany of them that are are bad actors um, in the landslide world. Um, so that's like the general physical and geology makeup. Um, over here on the right, this map is depicting actual. It's actually depicting slip rates of faults. So the 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 lightest, the deep red to light red are high slip rate faults over 16 millimeters per year. So we've got the San Andreas Fault um, that um, that's that runs through here, right up to the Mendocino Triple Junction, uh, the Garlock Fault. So this is a right lateral fault um, and our plate boundary, um, and the Garlock Fault, uh, which is a left lateral fault. The Eastern California Shear Zone. Uh, we've got the Owens Valley um, and um, the East, uh, the Sierra Frontal Fault. Or, um death valley fault out here i won't go into all of them but down and down south we have some big thrust faults we've got the north frontal thrust fault on the north side of the um, san bernardino mountains and then the uh, sierra madre cucamonga thrust system due to the restraining bend in the san andreas um, uh, on the south margin of the san gabriel mountains and then the san cayetano is another thrust system uh, uh, on the south margin in, in the Ventura area on the south margin of the Topa Topa Mountains. Um, so anyways, fault activity is key, right? Because, um, you know, we have earthquake induced landslides throughout the state and this relative, the slip rate map um, really kind of tells you where the hot spots are um, in the state um, for seismically induced landslides. Okay, so that's it on the geology faulting physical setting. Let me see if I can get my screen to advance here. Hang on. Ah, there we go. All right. So um, from a, a precipitation standpoint, uh, we've got quite a bit of diversity in the state. The north coast of the state is essentially a temperate rainforest where we're seeing over 100 inches a year annually. Um, and then you, you, you move down here to the desert southwest, the Mojave Desert, and you're, you're below um, 10 inches and in some areas below five inches annually. Um, so quite a bit of variation. And then the map on the right is, is really important. This is, this is Mike Dettinger's really great map uh, that shows the year to year variability in, preci in precipitation across the United States showing that California has the largest year to year precipitation precipitation variability and it's depicted by these uh, lighter green and really the darker green uh, circles indicate yearly variability on the order of half the annual average right so we get these big we get these big swings um, in in precipitation throughout the state um, really the, the the central and southern region are, are the are, are the areas where we see the greatest swings. Um, we uh, the map up here on the right is from Scripps uh, Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, uh, and it depicts uh, the tracks and locations of landfalling atmospheric rivers in the state. Um, this is from 2021, so we only had about six atmospheric rivers make landfall in California um, in 2021. Um, for the so it's the it's 2020 to 2021 water year, right? Um, so that was last year, which was essentially a drought year. But these things can be really um, big um, generators of of moisture and can really help our water supply. The at the Cat Five um, atmospheric river that hit us on the 24th and 25th of October um, put a lot of water on the state and really um, helped our um, dwindling water supply. OK, um, yeah, and just just to point out, you know, really the 
the coast ranges down to Southern California and the Sierra up to Shasta are really responding or really receiving more of their rainfall due to Pacific frontal storms um, versus the desert and the east side of the Sierra. Um, see, um, you know, the dominant amount of their rainfall is occurring in summer months, so summer monsoonal season. So this is winter, winter cool season rainfall summer warm season rainfall. Um, so now I'm going to talk about landslide damages in the state. Um, so, you know, who who compiles landslide damages in the state? I would love to say it was the California Geological Survey, um, but I but the answer really is everyone but no one at the same time. Um, and it's unfortunate because there's there's no real like systematic comprehensive data set that could be used for you know for um, earthquake damage projections climate projections um, those of you that have worked with landslide damages and associated costs probably understand this really well um, you know we've got caltrans that's documenting their roadway damages we might have our state department of water resources that are documenting landslide damages to water infrastructure but the you know the the counties and the communities um, might be doing some in an ad hoc basis but that's it's never brought up to a state level in a way that can be um, really useful for the landslide hazards practitioners um, with that said, I'll just highlight some uh, selected um, rainfall related um, damaging events in California. Um, I'm sorry, there's a dog barking. I'm hoping you can't hear that. Um, so 1968 to 1969, uh, Bay Area was a big, uh, big event, 150 million in damages. 1980, 1.1 billion in landslide damages in Southern California. Uh, 82 was a big shallow landslide event over a two-day period in the Bay Area, uh, 132 million in damages. El Nino was really statewide, but a lot of losses in the Bay Area. And then the Thomas Fire, the post Thomas Fire debris flow was like a single event post fire debris flow um, that uh, was roughly 1.5 billion in damages. Um, some lands, some um, evaluation of Caltrans data uh, based on landslides impacting road, road roadway infrastructure was done by um, Chris Wills, uh, the former program manager, um, and published in 20 uh, 2012, um, and it. It said, you know, basically um, concluded that in average rainfall years, um, Caltrans spends about 20 to 40 million um, on landslide damages. And in, in exceptional years, uh, and those are years, I think it's exceptional is defined as rainfall about 20 to 30 percent over average for the state. Um, they spend about 150 million in landslide um, repairs. Uh, but in 2016 and 17 was a big that was a wet year for California. They spent about a billion in roadway damages. Um, and furthermore, you know, there's been some loss estimates done. Uh, there was a lot of it was based off of what Chris Chris Wills had done uh, with the USGS arc storm um, uh, project in 2012 um, that suggested you know two billion dollars in roadway and other infrastructure losses um, under this uh, this massive arc storm scenario um, some examples let's get to the examples I know you you all want to see photos of landslides so the 1982 uh, Bay Area event was a regional event um, it there were a lot of shallow landslides it was really um, two days or 48 hours of rainfall. Um, depending on where you look, you know, roughly a 50 to 100 year annual return interval, 18,000 slides, 25 people lost their lives, um, 100 homes uh, were damaged or destroyed. Um, I already talked about the total cost, but, you know, here you have, you know, shallow landslides, debris slides that mobilized, didn't quite consolidate. Um, some that did consolidate and went into the backs of these homes. These ones, these uh, these shallow landslides mobilized as debris flows and came down these ravines. Um, this home was knocked off its foundation by a debris flow in Corta, Corta Madera. A deeper seated landslide took out a home here in Sausalito. Uh, a home 
and an RV um, involved in a debris flow and it looks like a spraying water line here um, in San Rafael. And then in Inverness in the, on the coast of Tamales Bay, uh, we had debris flows coming out and just destroying homes uh, that were right on the coastline. Um, so big event. Um, 97, 98 El Nino was a really a, a statewide event. Um, there was really good documentation of damages in the Bay Area that was done by um, uh, by uh, Jonathan Gott and, and a variety of other um, USGS researchers. Um, 150 million in direct losses in the 10 counties for the San Francisco Bay, 300 slides causing damages or more than 300 slides, but several thousand debris flows that were somewhat non-impactful. Um, the largest slide was this Mission Peak landslide complex, roughly 13 million cubic yards um, uh, involving all of the side of this mountain here. Um, and then we had landslides in uh, in Southern California, two pretty large deep seated landslides uh, affecting homes in Orange County, Laguna de Niguel area. Okay. And then just a little bit on the, um, the, the uh, post Thomas fire uh, debris flows. This was uh, the Thomas fire burned in 2017, Ventura, uh, and Santa Barbara counties, uh, about a 280,000 acre fire. Um, we had a very weak atmospheric river uh, where uh, that came on shore. The low pressure as it moved in de uh, developed some convect convective cells, so an alignment of convective cells that were called a narrow cold, cold frontal rain band. And those drove up the rain rates. So we had rain rates of um, like 100 millimeters per hour. Um, but really at a really short duration. Um, so there's $1.5 billion in damages. You can read this, you know, 23 people, seven bridges, uh, 500 buildings. So this map shows the location of the buildings in the Montecito area, you know, red being complete destruction, green being light damage. Uh, 42 homes were swept off their foundations. We had homes swept off their foundations on Randall Road here. This is the main creek, but this is all, you know, these are all alluvial fans, right? They're composite fans. Um, so they're sensitive to fire. They start to see debris flows after fire. Um, that's what occurred here. Um, this arrow right here is pointing to a boulder. Um, just above my cursor, next to that boulder is an excavator. So that gives you a sense of size. That boulder is about, you know, the size of a tow truck. We had, you know, starting from the upper watersheds, rills and gullies, uh, the snowball effect bulking and the development of debris flows, um, evacuations, evacuation of channels down to bedrock, uh, debris flows that overwhelmed uh, bridges, knocked bridges off their abutments, deposited boulders on the abutments. Um, cars and debris slammed into buildings, uh, you know, debris flows and flooding, you know, really um, hyper concentrated flooding, making it down onto the interstate um, or the US Highway 101, which connects really LA from areas to the to, uh, two areas to the north and closed the highway for 13 days. Um, and then, um, you know, of course, boulder fields um, from debris flows stacking up almost up to the eaves of this um, this home here. Um, so really uh, intense rainfall on a burn area, uh, more than 20 debris flows issued. Um, alluvial fans um, are um, not great places to live if they're downstream of watersheds that burn and are subject to high intensity rainfall. Um, a little bit on earthquake related losses. Um, so 1906, uh, San Francisco earthquake, uh, we had more than 10,000 landslides, killed 11 people, lots of damages to buildings and um, infrastructure. The Loma Prieta earthquake, which I mentioned earlier, which, um, which started the Seismic um, Hazards Mapping Act um, in 1989, that generated thousands of slides, uh, damaged hundreds of residences uh, uh, based on Kiefer's work damage probably exceeded $34 million. 
Um, and then the Northridge quake down in Southern California, just north of, of downtown Los Angeles, 11,000 landslides and lots of property damage. Um, so this is just the other end of the spectrum. If we're not seeing extreme rainfall, we might see um, we might see earthquakes uh, that produce landslides. And we have we usually, we have 70 have seen documented 75 earthquakes larger than magnitude six since uh, since 1769. And we get, you know, a magnitude six uh, or greater every 2.7 years and a magnitude seven or greater every nine years. Um, so the earthquake triggering factor for landslides is ever present in most parts of the state. Um, some examples, uh, 1906, it's a crusty old photo of, uh, of the Makama Creek rock, uh, rock slide. Um, the 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, we've got a shallow you know, debris slide, bluff failure um, on the San Francisco Peninsula, a home affected by a landslide. Uh, the Northridge event, uh, you know, had kind of broad um, landslide response in the region, but mostly, you know, lots of shallow landslides. Um, this is a kind of a pixelated photo, but um, a photo of the San Gabriel Mountains after that event. And there's lots of dust coming off those mountains because there's d debris slides everywhere. Um, every steep slope was issuing debris slides. Um, looked like the hills were on fire. And then here's another bluff failure um, during that event. OK, so. All right, um, so more recent events. Uh, we had the Mud Creek, the Mud Creek slide occur in um, in May of 2017. Uh, we had 80 inches of rain on the Big Sur coast. Um, so in, in, in spots almost double than average, double over the average rainfall. Uh, this slide was more than 6 million cubic yards, created 15 acres of new coastline. It was a, almost half a kilometer margin to margin, um, and it, it extended the, the coastline outward of uh, about 1.17 uh, kilometers. The, the cost of removing and repairing the roadway here was $54 million uh, based on Caltrans estimates. And it's it's important to note that, you know, this is the one of California's sort of iconic highways um, really good views down the coast it connects highway one connects uh, the monterey peninsula with cities to the south and it's a lot of people you know fly in just to rent a car and drive down this stretch of coast because it's so beautiful but in wet years it is mayhem there um, it's landslide after landslide um, i'll show you the kind of the before and after um, hold on one second ah there we go so there's the before there's the after, before, and after one more time. Um, and uh, coincidentally, we um, worked with Caltrans back um, more than a decade ago to map landslides along the Highway 1 corridor. And we did capture all of these deep-seated slides in this area. Um, it, in this case, did it, you know, would it have helped much um, no, um, because there's so many landslides, there's really no place to move the road. Um, you can't move it up to the top of the mountain because there's just more landslides there. Um, and then I'll show you this GIF um, that was done by the USGS. So here's a GIF from John Warwick and Andy Ritchie. Um, I can take no credit for this other than um, other than being maybe being smart enough to find it and put it in my slide deck. Um, but it shows the slide occur and then, uh, you know, the removal of a lot of the upper portion of the slide mass um, so that they could unload, um, remove some of the driving forces of the slide. Show it one more time here. Okay. We'll move on. I think you've seen enough of that. OK, and then uh, and then a, a recent event during the COVID pandemic, um, Paul Burgess, who introduced me, um, uh, ran down to San Diego, North County, San Diego in April of, of uh, 2020. Uh, there was a regional landslide event um, in the area and a big debris flow came down and impacted this tennis court, um, this this country club uh, tennis 
club, sorry, and almost hit a school and it ran across the road and almost um, and closed the road for some time. Um, so not all um, storm generated landslides in the state are due from due to atmospheric rivers or, you know, convective cells, um, you know, in the desert. Um, this was a cutoff low. It circled around for five to seven days um, until it started sucking up quite a bit of uh, subtropical moisture. And we saw this is uh, the um, annual um, maximum storm total per year um, for the area since like 1963. And the average is 55 millimeters a year per storm. We saw 188 millimeters for that storm, for the storm that generated that debris flow. Um, show you a little bit more. I'm going to speed up here because I know I've got a lot more to talk about. Um, uh, Paul was able to obtain drone footage um, and then we had the pre-event LIDAR. So they developed a differencing model um, to identify how much meter, uh, how much volume of landslide material uh, came from the source area. Um, unfortunately, this bluff area, there was a little ravine there that the locals had filled with trash and, uh, you know, non-engineered fill um, and that all was evacuated and mobilized as this debris flow. Okay, So now um, I'm going to move on into uh, the California's iconic uh, really mega landslide. So this is the landslide fantasy world and some of the landslides I'm going to show you are obviously definite and some of them are probably questionable. Um, so let's 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 move right into that. Um, so first area I'm going to talk about is the Owens Valley. Um, some work was done by Kim Bishop in 1999 to map mega slides in the Owens Valley. Um, and so this is the town of Bishop here. This is the Owens Valley Dry Lake. The town of Independence is here. And these are all these the black areas are all these mega slides that were mapped um, uh, by Kim Bishop. Um, uh, Bishop on this little inset map is here. Uh, the Sierra uh, Nevada frontal fault is here, which is essentially a normal fault, um, I think with some oblique slip to it. And then the Owens Valley fault, fault is more of a like a right lateral strike slip fault. So lots of potential for earthquake uh, generated ground motion to produce large landslides in the region. Um, OK, so moving on. So here we go. Here's um, a Google Earth shot um, showing uh, the east flank of the Sierra Nevada, the town of Bishop, the town of Big Pine, Highway 395 uh, running up, and then these large uh, deep-seated rock slides off of Coyote Flats, Crater Mountain, Big Pine, Bishop, um, and then the this Poverty Hills rock avalanche down here. I want to draw your attention to that. And then on the geologic map, that area, that Poverty Hills area, this little Inselberg that's surrounded by alluvial fans and Quaternary volcanics, um, is shown here as this little pink blob on our state geologic map. Um, and then the Quaternary volcanics are around it. Um, and then we'll move to the next one. So this one is, um, I would, you know, it's questionable to probable. Um, the inferred source area is off the west flank of the Inyo Mountains. Um, here's the Poverty Hills. The area of this deposit um, is about nine kilometers squared. Uh, the the runout distance is about ten point eight kilometers. Um, if if uh, this slide did initiate here and run out through this area. The zone of runout, uh, many features left behind are, are really overprinted by alluvial fan deposits and a 90,000 year old uh, basalt flow that's dated to 90,000 years. So minimum age, if this truly is a slide, is about is 90 Ka. Um, these are photos from Brian Swanson um, just showing uh, outcrops of the Poverty Hills deposits, um, you know, fractured brecciated Jurassic granodiorite on the left um, and sheared and broken uh, Paleozoic metasedimentary rock on, on the right. Um, and as, as far as I'm aware, um, there's been no real um, dating done on this slide. Um, 
So next one um, would be the <clears throat> um, the Sage Flat or Olancha, uh, Olancha rock slide. So here we are, we're looking down, uh, looking south towards Victorville. Uh, the town of Olancha would be off the map here. Um, uh, the, t the town of Victorville, Ridgecrest is over here. So Victorville is way off in the distance. Ridgecrest is over here. This is the Sage Flat um, rock slide. Um, pretty massive uh, feature, 11.3 kilometers squared uh, with a run out you know, length of uh, 4.5 kilometers. Um, again, you know, perhaps questionable, but there's been some work. Um, this is you know, mostly Kim Bishop's work and then Brian Swanson from the CGS has been out there uh, looking at, you know, shear zones, brecciated zones um, up uh, on the, the upper um, portion of the slide mass and has done, you know, collected um, rock samples and looked at thin sections and described, you know, some uh, fractured up pulverized um, mineral textures um, within the, um, within the, um, sheared and brecciated deposits. Um, so anyways, this is a this is a, uh, a bit of landslide fantasy. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on these on big rock slides like this. Um, and I'll show you some more um, if you're interested. Uh, the Black Hawk rock avalanche is probably one of the most iconic uh, long run out rock av avalanches in the state. Um, you know, uh, here we've got the Los Angeles Basin, the San Andreas Fault, the Hellendale Fault, uh, Thrust Fault, North Frontal Fault System. Um, we're looking west. Uh, the Big Bear Lake area is here. This uh, rock, rock avalanche came off of Silver Peak. So Silver Peak is here, ran out roughly 9.8 kilometers. It's about 17 kilometers in area. Uh, was originally dated to 17,000 years before present, um, but uh, those dates have been revised to 30 to 35,000 years before present. And this is a really great slide. If you're visiting the area, Highway 247, uh, coming out of the Victorville area, um, you can drive right up this dirt road into this quarry. You can drive up any of these dirt roads, I believe. Um, and you can look at the rock avalanche textures. There's some like, classic domino breccia features. Um, uh, that are exposed in this rock in the in the in this rock avalanche. Okay, another big one, uh, the Martinez Mountain rock avalanche. So this is um, some information that was provided by Nick Barth, and I've I've included um, his presentation on this rock avalanche. The link to it here, um, if anybody's interested. Uh, but this is uh, again, we're kind of looking west. Uh, the town of uh, the city of San Diego is down here. Los Angeles is up here. This is the San Jacinto Fault, right lateral strike slip fault, part of uh, the San Andreas Fault System. It's the most active subsidiary of the San Andreas in the area. Martinez Mountain, here's the source area. Uh, uh, rock avalanche run out of 8.5 kilometers uh, down onto the basin margin, uh, roughly 12.6 square kilometers in area. Uh, Nick and his grad students have dated this based on exposure age dating um, at about 45,000 years before present. Really deep, deep varnish on the surface. Really interesting to look at. A photo from me from my uncle's aircraft here, looking back at Toro Peak. Um, you know, like I, the start of this was titled Moving Mountains, right? I mean, this was a, a whole peak that um, mobilized probably due, due to an earthquake. Um, and uh, and and traveled down, made a leftward bend, and deposited here at the basin margin. Um, so these are um, you know these are this one is a little more difficult to to drive to um, compared to the the Black Hawk slide, um, but um, jump in Google Earth and spin around. Um, I encourage you because this one's a this one's a a looker. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, okay, um, and then lastly, I'm going to leave you with one last big thing. Um, I've got 10 minutes left, so I'll leave some time for questions. Uh, I'll leave you with, uh, you know, 
an iconic uh, debris fan um, down in the peninsula ranges on the border of the Colorado desert. Um, this fan is on the south side of the Santa Rosa Mountains. Um, it's bounded on, um, just off the screen down here by the San Jacinto Fault. Um, I like to show this one. I think it's really, um, you know, is this a landslide or many landslides? I think they, we all know the answer. It's a debris fan. It's comprised of many debris flows stacked up over time. It really uh, helps depict the, um, dis you know, avulsion and the distributary nature of flow paths on these systems. And I think it's it, a photo like this is really useful if you're talking to, let's say, a land manager in the Pacific Northwest or BC or Alaska, um, where you know you can't um, you know you can't see all of these debris flow tracks and snouts and marginal levees um, through the air you know through the air because you have trees and pine needles covering the ground. Um, so this one's special in that, you know, it, I, I just imagine that those debris fans in the Pacific Northwest um, probably look a lot like this um, if you strip away, um, you know, the pine needles and the forest. Um, so with that, um, uh, that is all I have. Um, thank you for, um, for listening. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the latter half of this, um, looking at the really big... Uh, mountain moving landslides. Um, so thank you.